And it's good to be in church this morning. I don't know about y'all, but we've had a pretty fantastic weekend around here. We had 60 volunteers yesterday serving 400 kids. What a blast we had, man. Woo! Feels like we were just here. I don't know about you, but I am ready to worship this morning, ready to hear from God. If you don't mind, we're going to pray real quick, and let's ask God to be in this place. Pray with me. Jesus, we need you. We need you in our families. We need you in our homes. We need you for those of us that are single, for those of us that are married, for those of us who are trying to figure out this phase of life. God, be with us this morning. Show us something from your word. Show us something from the other believers in our life who are in faith following you. Jesus, speak to my heart. Speak to our hearts this morning as only you can. We pray that you would use this time we spend together in your word to do something in us that would not only bless us, but would lead us to the blessing of others, loving more people, encouraging more people, serving and investing in the lives around us. Jesus, we're your church. Prepare us this morning so you can use us this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You guys have a seat. Pumped to be in church this morning, starting a new series. And uh, man, I am thrilled to see your face this morning. Last night was fun. Dude, we had some minions out there. I saw Scooby-Doo out there. And those of you that don't know, man, it's something to be a volunteer and, and volunteer to put on a sweaty costume in, in, in late fall, you know, early fall. You know what I'm saying? That's another great reason fall started yesterday. It means we're going to have some fall colors here soon. It's going to start cooling off. We're not going to sweat every time we open our doors. I cannot wait, man. This is the best time of year. And I'm also pumped because we're starting a new series this morning. A lot of you know about it. We're starting a series called Home Improvements and uh, how to build stronger families. And let me just own up to something real quick, man. Some of y'all been asking me already, saying, Pastor Mark, what do you got to say about families when you ain't got kids? Let me tell you something, okay? We need to understand that even when you don't have kids, you got a family. Even when your kids move out and go to college, you're still a family, all right? Those of you in the room who aren't married yet, you're preparing to have a family. We got some people in the house this morning who they, their phase of family may be different than yours, but every one of us have a family, a home that we are fighting for. I, I love what Terry and Jenny said last week in their testimony. They talked about finding each other late in life and the, the, the pleasure that comes from that, but also the difficulty and the struggles that come from that. And so no matter what phase your family is in, look, my wife and I, we, we trust that one day God's gonna bless us with kids. But right now, we got two dogs that run our lives, okay? So we're enjoying this phase of our life because you gotta take your kids with you and we can leave ours in a cage, you know what I'm saying? We leave them locked up and don't nobody report us to child services because you're allowed to do that with dogs and you come home and feed them and they love you to death, Okay. Lock your kids up in a cage, lock your dog up in a cage, see which one likes you better after five hours. You know what I'm saying? Don't do that. It's illegal. Obviously, you're not supposed to do that. I got to throw disclaimers in there these days. All right, you know what I'm saying? No matter which phase of life you're in, you got a family. And here's the deal. That word family for some of you is hard. It's difficult. Because when you hear that word, like you picture some things that aren't really going right like you thought they would. Hey, can I, can I draw a picture for you that a lot of us had in our mind? I remember being a teenager and thinking about how my family was going to work. See, we had it all figured out. We had this plan where, like most of us, right, we knew we were going to go to school, and then we were going to get out of school. Maybe we go to college, maybe we don't, but we were going to get married in our 20s, right? And then maybe by our late 20s, early 30s, we're going to start having kids, and we're going to have this beautiful family, and your kids are going to be gorgeous. They're going to be photogenic. They're going to smile when the camera comes out. And when you're around strangers, they're going to behave, and they're going to do what you tell them to, and they're going to do their chores and their homework, and they're going to be straight-A students, and you're going to get the bumper sticker. This is my child. It's smarter than your child. That's what it really says. And you're going to love it. And your life is going to be great because when they're teenagers, your teenagers aren't going to be sassy and they're not going to eat that much because somehow the world doesn't apply to you. You're going to get away with all this. And then your kids are going to move out and you're going to be this 50-year-old who looks still like they're 35 and you're going to be loving life, right? And we all woke up and that's not what's happened in our lives. You were in your late 20s and you still ain't found that dude or that lady yet. You were in your 30s and your kids are not photogenic at all. <laughs> Everybody's nice to you, but you know. <laughs> no, they're cute as could be, but as soon as you get them dressed up for family photo day, it's like the tears just start coming and they start screaming and their eyes are red and you try to Photoshop it, but there's no saving it. That photo's done. You do your best to live out this dream, this plan that you had for your family. And we joke around. Some of you, you're walking through real deep waters because it's worse than that. It's worse than bad photos. It's like you don't even feel like your kids talk to you. 
If you picked up the phone right now, you're not sure that they would answer. They're grown. You've had a disconnect. Some of you, you wanted to start a family by now and it's like God says no and makes everything difficult and you're like, what? This is a good thing. This is the thing you, you say, bless. This is the thing you, you call us to. This is the thing that I thought by now you'd let it happen for us. Why? Why us? And so this word family, it's so beautiful when we picture it. But once we start living it out, it gets hard. God, why am I still alone? I feel like I'm a pretty good catch. I feel like I would be a good husband. I feel like I would be a good wife. I feel like I would be a good dad, a good mom. Why are, why are you holding out on me? Why are you give, putting this picture in my mind of all these blessed things and I don't have it yet? God, why, why is our marriage struggling now that our kids have moved out and we're the only ones we have to talk to? Why don't I want to be around my wife anymore? Why, why, don't I, why don't I get joy when it's just the two of us hanging out? Why is it such a chore? Because, you know, we pictured this perfect thing and we didn't anticipate the challenges. And anytime things start going wrong, this little word comes up. It's the word bail. Like, man, maybe I should just jump. Maybe I should just start over. Maybe, 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 maybe I'm the problem. Maybe, maybe they'd be better off without me. Maybe, maybe. And we start talking ourselves down and talking ourselves out of what we know we wanted. And now we're not even sure how to get there. I have really good news for you. I've looked in the scriptures. I haven't found any perfect families. Not one. I found some broken homes. I found some hurting people. I found some families that operated like they just hated one another. We're actually going to talk about one of them this morning. Today's message is really simple. I want you to know that God can change any family. You say, Mark, you don't know what we're dealing with. You don't know how every night it's just a chore. I don't even want to be around her. The kids are tired of us fighting. You don't understand. We are going through some broken, hurt feelings right now of disappointment and discouragement. I want you to know that I do not know what you are going through. But I can tell you, like, I've been through some things. My wife and I have been married for 12 years and we have found God's promises to be faithful and we have found God's presence to be faithful. We have found God's word to be faithful and sometimes you don't wanna be around each other. Sometimes things are hard. There are highs and there are lows, but I want you to understand something. God can use and change any family, yours included. No matter how bad you feel like it is, no matter how awful you feel like it is, he can use your family. And so we're gonna start a challenge as a church Today, today, we as a church, we're gonna start a challenge. No matter what stage your family's in, you say, Mark, I don't have a family yet. No, you're preparing for a family. Mark, I just came out, I got divorced, I'm, I'm starting over. I want you to understand, you are in a phase right now that you didn't plan on, but you are preparing for the family God is gonna use you to bless and to encourage. And if you have kids or not, your family, I want you to accept this challenge. We're gonna talk about the different parts of this challenge toward the end of the message, but I want you to understand something. The reason I use the word challenge is because it's hard, okay? When we're training, when some of you wanna run these marathons, these 5Ks, good luck, by the way. You guys have fun with that. I, I'll cheer you from the sidelines, you know, and give you a cup of water. Good luck, all right, that's me. You get ready for it, you prepare for it, you make sure you eat right, you get, and we, we treat our families, we want this thing and we never put any effort into it. It takes challenge, it takes effort, and if you're not married yet, you need to start getting prepared. If you haven't had kids yet, from what I understand, you need to start getting prepared, because it changes everything. But I got some good news for you. God can change any family, number one, because God loves the family. He does, he absolutely loves it. Look at what he says in Psalm 127 in verse one. He talks about himself in the idea of the family. This is an ascent, a song that they sang. He says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. He says, look, I want to build your house. I am all about building your house, but you gotta understand, I gotta be a part of this. You are asking for two natural people, sinful people, 
broken people to come together in it to work, that's a supernatural work and only I can do it. So we got to understand, God loves the family and he wants to be a part of your family. And then he says in Genesis chapter 2, read what he says in verse 22 about the first family and the rib the Lord God had taken from the man that he made into a woman. He didn't take it out of his foot to be under the man. He didn't take it out of his head to be over the man. He took it his rib to be with the man. We are created together. Brought her to the man. He said, this is at last the bone of my bones. This is Adam talking. Flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. This is beautiful, right? This is day one of marriage. These are the vows. Do you remember your vows? That's the, do you even remember your vows? If you remember them, they were so wonderful. Till death do us part. Only death could rob me of you. I'll always want to be with you. <laughs> Except for when I'm on my phone. <laughs> or when my buddies call. Or I got stuff to do in the garage. <laughs> I have a garage, guys. I have tools in that garage. Those of you who've seen me work with tools know I don't use those tools often. <laughs> and yet, sometimes when we're not getting along, I want to be in the garage. We don't even have air conditioning in the garage. Look what he says next. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become this beautiful word, one flesh. You can't even separate them. This is the intention of marriage, by the way. Between a man and a woman, he wants you to love each other so much that when you hurt, she hurts. When she's lonely, you're lonely. When she's wondering and feels lost, you are wondering and feel lost. You feel everything together. You love each other. But we have gotten into this autonomous, independent culture where we're like, nah, I'm all about me. No, no, marriage says it's all about us. And so when I have a decision at work that could move my family, I don't just say, what does my boss want me to do? I don't just say, what would this do for my career? I say, honey, this affects you. I need your input. I'm not gonna tell you we're moving a thousand miles. I'm gonna tell you, I wanna know what you're feeling. What would this do to our children? This is an us decision, not a me telling you. But some of us, we have never gotten to that one flesh. God created this to be a beautiful expression of his love for the church. Over and over in the New Testament, God uses marriage to describe and illustrate his love for the church. We are together, we are united. I have some more good news. Not only does God love the family, but God excels. God loves using average families. Man, that is good news for me and you. Can I tell you more about the first family we just read about? You know, Adam and Eve gave birth to a murderer, killed his own brother. That perfect ideal family didn't last too long in the real world. Their son killed their other son. Abraham loved his wife until he cheated on her. Oh, but he asked. His son Isaac and his wife Rebecca played favorites with their kids and really messed them up. Moses and his wife had some terrible fights, awful fights. You go through the scripture piece by piece. The people that God entrusted his son to lost him. They lost Jesus on the way home one day. These are bad parents. I can say that because I don't have kids, so I'm still going to be a perfect parent. And whenever I have kids, I'll never lose them. They'll, they'll never get lost. I'll, I'll have a leash. <laughs> I'll figure something out. You know, it's good news that God excels at using average families, normal people who are broken and hurting just like me and you. And so this morning, I want to kind of read through a passage that deals with one of the families that I just mentioned, um, especially the two brothers. See, Isaac and Rebecca, they had two boys, twin boys, and their names were Jacob and Esau. And when Esau was born, he was born first. But Jacob, like they were born twins. Jacob was holding on to him. They were fighting and striving inside her womb like they were just at each other's throats. And they come out and Esau is the epitome of a man's man, a boy's boy. Do you know what I'm saying? The athlete, dad's son the one that dad is proud of on the sports team, the one that is big and strong and everybody says is a leader. 
Boy, Esau, he is dad's favorite. Jacob realizes very quickly that his brother is stronger, but he is not smarter. He's a little dense in the head, hard-headed. And so Jacob, he's a crafty, wise little scoundrel. Some of you already, you're figuring out, I'm Esau in my family. Some of you are figuring out, I'm definitely Jacob because I'm smarter than all those fools. Like, I know exactly what I'm doing. Some of you are realizing, my brother's Jacob. He's been using us for years, all right? (laughs) Jacob and Esau, as they're growing up, dad loves Esau. Esau would go out hunting. That was like their athletic thing. He would bring in big game and fix incredible meals. Mom loved Jacob because Jacob was wise, smart, and he liked spending more time inside with mom than out there in the rough woods. He was what we'd call soft-skinned, okay? He was an interior guy. Esau was the outside hunts guy. He'd go out, he'd go out, he'd come in smelling a little bit and Jacob would be like, whew, you don't smell so good. Esau would be like, you smell too good. Like you, you are spending too much time inside, buddy. So they were at each other's throats. Well, when they were young, their dad's getting older it becomes apparent that their birthright, their blessing, what we would think of as an inheritance, it always went from top down. Like if you were the firstborn, you got way more. We do not live in that culture. Most of us now, when our parents pass on, it's split between the siblings. And uh, those of us that are only children are like, yeah, amen. And uh, like, but back then it was the firstborn. He got like the majority, the lion's share. But Esau was not that smart. So Jacob tricks him into giving Jacob the birthright, but then he tricks his own dad. He goes in, he like puts on goat skin to pretend he's hairy. I mean, come on, picture that. His dad's like pretty much blind at this point and his dad blesses Jacob. And once he does that, like it's, he's spoken it. It's the law. Jacob's gonna get the lion's share of the inheritance. And so Esau has, just gets mad and he's gonna kill his brother. Now we've seen this before. We've seen brothers killing each other. I know your family's a little crazy, but can you imagine if one of your brothers said to your other brother, if I see you in town again, I'm going to kill you. No, not like I'm going to hurt you. Not like I'm going to wrestle you. I'm going to take your life. I'm going to put you in the ground. I'm going to bury you. And Jacob runs. He runs to an extended family that's a long ways away. And on the way, God begins to speak to him and God is drawing him. God wants a relationship with him. But Jacob is not in the frame of mind or the state of mind or the place in his life where he's ready to submit and follow God. And so he goes to his extended family and guess what? The trickster becomes the tricked. He gets fooled. He thinks he's gonna marry this beautiful girl, but he gets tricked himself and he marries her sister who wasn't as pretty, how can I say, all right? And he gets fooled into working for seven years and then 14 years of labor. But here's the deal. While he's there, God begins to prosper him. He becomes wealthy. He becomes very wealthy. And his extended family gets jealous of him And he realizes it's time for him to leave and take his family back to his homeland. He wants to see his mom. He wants to see the place he grew up. But in order to do that, he has to cross through some land that is now ruled by a very athletic, big, strong leader named Esau. See, not only has God been blessing Jacob, Esau has become the leader of this land he must pass through. And he's got a lot of guys that look up to him who are not like Jacob, think, think people who think and connive. They're more, you said, kill him, I'll kill him. You said, protect them, I'll protect them. He's got an army at his disposal. And so Jacob realizes that he's gonna have to go through this land. And I want you to read with me in Genesis chapter 32 beginning in verse nine, how Jacob begins to prepare. The first thing Jacob does is he prays. He says, oh God, my father, God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, oh Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your country. He said, God, I'm trying to do what's right. I'm trying to go back home. I'm trying to go to my people because you wanna do me good. I am not worthy of the least of all these deeds of steadfastness and love and the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. He says, God, you have been good to me. For with only my staff, he says, I came across this way with a staff in my hand. I was running for my life. God, you've blessed me. Can we pause for a second? Wouldn't it be good for a lot of us to just reflect over the last few years how good God's been to us? 
Boy, God has been good to me. I didn't have much. You know, a lot of us were not born with a silver spoon in our mouth. A lot of us right here in this room, we were not born with a big inheritance coming our way. We were not born with a whole lot of laps of luxuries, but we have been blessed. God has been good to us. Sure, there's people who have more. There will always be people who have more, but God's been good to me. He says, I crossed the Jordan and now I have become two camps. He says, look at this. I am filling two camps with family, with extended family. I have people who work for me. I have been blessed. He says, God, I need you to deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. Do you know why prayers like this work? Because they are specific. I am tired of families praying, God bless us. God be with us. God help us. How? How will you ever know if your prayer is answered if you never put specifics on it? He says, God, I need you to deliver me from my brother. His name is Esau, in case you forgot, because I fear him. He may come and attack me and the mothers and the children. But you said, and he reminds God of his promises. He says, you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. He says, God, you have promised that you will bless me. You have put good into my life. You have blessed me. I need you to be there for me. So the first thing your family needs this morning, number one, this is part of our challenge. Your family needs prayer. You need prayer in your family. I don't just mean praying over the dinner table. God bless this food. Bless the hands that prepared it. Help us to have a good night. I need you this week to be praying for your family, dad. Mom, I need you to be praying. Those of you that are single, you need to start praying now. God, prepare me for the family you are going to entrust me with. You and I need to be praying for God to use us in our family. God can change us, but it starts with prayer. So the first challenge, I'm gonna challenge our church for the next 28 days. Next 28 days, I'm gonna challenge everybody in our church to be praying for your family. You say, Mark, my kids are grown. You need to pray for them. Mark, I don't have any kids yet. You need to pray for them. Mark, you don't understand. Everything's falling apart. You need to understand the power of prayer. Prayer is not God fix them, God make them better. God, I've been blessed and I've done some things and it's time for me to own up to some things. Jacob's not running saying, God, fix this. He's walking right into it saying, God, I'm gonna meet with my brother. I'm gonna look him in the eyes and I'm gonna deal with what's broken. See, a lot of us like this prayer thing, but we don't like the challenge that comes from prayer. You spend some time with God, you're gonna, wait, you're gonna open your eyes and you're gonna say, whew, God, I expected you to show me what was wrong with them and now you're saying this is what's wrong with you and you're telling me I need to do this and this and this and that's the hard part. God can change your family, but we need prayer. Second thing your family needs, it's a little farther down in the passage. Read with me, starting in verse 24 of Genesis 32. It says, Jacob was alone. See, for your family to really get where God wants it to get, there's gonna be some together times, there's gonna be some alone times, dad. Mom, there's gonna be some time you need to get alone, you need to figure this out. When you, before you're married, before you have kids, you need to get alone with God and say, we need to work this out. And you know this story, if you've been in church at all, that Jacob is about to wrestle with God in a real way, in a physical way that really is going to illustrate some spiritual truths in your life, in my life, in Jacob's life. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Jacob spent all night wrestling with God and what God had for him. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. This is a serious wrestle. They are fighting for life. And this individual puts his hip out of joint and it's hard. And he said, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I am not letting go. Some of us need to spend some time with God and say, God, I'm not opening my eyes from this prayer until we figure my family thing out. God, I'm not giving up until we figure this out. And do you know why Jacob could say this? Do you know why Jacob could do this? Why Jacob had a relationship with God where he could confront God in this way and talk to God? Because Jacob had a personal relationship with God. Understand this. If you're here this morning and you want your family to be all that it can be, you need a personal relationship with God, not just your wife. 
not just your kids. I am so glad that your kids are in a fun environment, a safe environment where they are learning about Jesus. But your kids need more than their relationship with God. They need you to have a relationship with God. Not the kind where you go to church and say, I believe. Not the kind where you put on a piece of paper, I'm a Christian. Not the kind where you just put on Facebook, under faith, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian. The kind where you live it out. Your kids need to see that. Your wife needs to see that. Your husband needs to see that. Because one flesh does not happen on its own naturally. Naturally, what happens is we get together, we spend some time together, and I realize you are not like I thought you were. I'm not like you thought I was. And so we have two different paths. I want to go this way, and you want to go that way. But supernaturally, God wants to unite you into one flesh. It doesn't just happen on its own. It is difficult. It is spiritual. Those of you who've been married more than a month know that marriage is more than a physical union. It is more than a relational union. It is not just living together. It is a spiritual union. It is difficult, but it is worth it. And it doesn't just happen. Why? Because God created it that way. He created you with a need for him. He created marriage with your need for him. He created your family with a need for him. If you build it on your own, it will not last only if God builds it. Understand this. You can come to church. You can hear the word. You can do everything you're supposed to. But if you don't have a personal relationship with God, it is for nothing. I'm so glad you got baptized. I'm so glad you serve. I am so glad that you make a difference in your community. But if you don't have a relationship where you pray and you talk to God and you have at one point in your life turned from your ways and claimed God's way. Listen, this was a one-time experience that Jacob had where he wrestled with God. You ask him about it, he remembered it. It happened here, this is where it happened, and this is what happened. I've met too many people who claim to be believers. They can't tell you when they trusted Jesus. They can't tell you how they trusted Jesus. They say things like, I've just always known God. No. In the New Testament, it's very clear. There comes a point in your life where you realize, I am broken, my way is not working, I need God, and you pray and you say, doesn't matter how you say it, but you say something to this effect, God, I have done it my way. I have tried this and I need you. Not just your word, not just good church people in my life telling me what's what. I don't just need to go to group. I need you. You died on the cross for me. You sent your son to die for me. I I am all yours. My way is done. I'm ready to follow your ways. And it is this one-time moment where you turn from your ways to follow his ways. Now, that one-time moment leads to actions. Jacob gets up from this encounter and it changes his life. For those of you interested in the rest of the story, he does go to his brother. His brother has hundreds of armed men and Jacob is sweating. He puts his family far back behind him so that if anything turns, they can run. He goes before his brother. He uses kind words. These are relationship tips for those of you who are having trouble right now. (laughs) Put the sharp objects away, you know. He gives a gift to his brother. He calls his brother Lord. I am your servant. He owns up. Esau, I was wrong. Boy, it's hard to say that, isn't it? Now, we all want Jacob to say it, but none of us want to say that to our brother or sister. None of us want to say that to our wife or husband. Say, Mark, you don't understand. I don't need to know more than the fact that none of us are perfect. I'm sure there's something, something you can go forward with an apology for. But what happens next? Esau He says, you're my brother. We've grown up. I'm not gonna kill you. They embrace. Jacob moves on. Goes to his homeland. And he's blessed. With 12 sons. He lives a good life. He has highs, he has lows. Makes mistakes. Some of his kids disappoint him. Some of them, they honor him. Hear me. That's the life I want for you. That's the life I want for me. If you're a believer in the room, my challenge to you is to start praying for your family daily. The second part of my challenge is we have five more weeks of this series. I know that some of you, I'm just gonna say it, this is the truth. Some of you, you're like a once a monther. 
I see you. Hey, what's up? You come to church once a month. Some of you come to church like twice a year. Some of you, you're here every week, man. You know me, I know you. I'm gonna challenge every one of you to pray for your family for the next 28 days every day and to not miss the next four weeks of church as we go through this series. You say, I don't wanna hear what you have to say. That's good, because I'm not the only one that's gonna be talking. I got some people coming up here who are gonna talk to you about what it's like to raise a family when everything doesn't go right. I got some people that are gonna come up here and talk to you about raising a family when you got more kids than you thought you'd have. I'm gonna have some people coming up here talking to you about your stage of life and their stage of life and what that means to raise a family. And if you're not here, you are gonna miss it. So my challenge this morning for you believers, be at church, pray for your family. It seems so simple until things come up and things happen. If you're in the room this morning and you're not a believer, I go to church, Mark. I didn't ask that. Mark, I've always been in church. I didn't ask that. Mark, I believe there's a God. I didn't ask that. I'm saying, do you remember a specific point? You don't have to know the date. You don't remember, have to remember the name of the city you were in, but do you remember a one point in your life? Maybe you were 15, maybe you were 75, maybe you were 25. There was a point where you turned for your life and you said, God, I'm yours. I'm ready to follow you. I give my life to you. If you don't remember doing that, I'm telling you, you need a moment where you wrestle this out with God and you deal with this need. God is tired of your just going to church, throwing some money in the plate, serving. Say, Mark, do you, look, it's great when people serve. We love for people to support the mission and vision of the church. But if you are doing those things and you are not a believer, I am lying to you if I'm telling you that's okay. I want you to know the truth. God needs your heart, not your money. God needs your heart, not your time serving. I'm so glad you wanna serve. I'm so glad you've realized this need in your life. God created you to serve because you were created in his image. You want a relationship with him. I wanna deal with your heart long before we ever talk about you serving, you giving, you doing. Your heart is what everything starts with. You could be the world's best husband on paper. You work hard, you do everything, but if you don't love your wife, that marriage will not work. Everything starts in the heart. Somebody needs this. Why not today be your day? Why not today be the day you say, God, I'm yours. I'm ready to trust you. I'm ready to give my life to you.